Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. Together, we've all worked for all of the major publishers in the business. We've published somewhere around 75 children's books, and we've all taught illustration at university art programs. That is right. Each week, we come at you guys with different audience questions or illustrator interviews that are amazing and super fun to listen to. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we argue, but each time you're going to learn something brand spanking new. One and done. (laughs) Very good. (laughs) Guys, I have to show you the latest in uh, AI um, technology. Your minds are about to be blown a little bit. And if you're uh, not on the YouTube channel, we're just going to have to give this a play by play for those of you listening in the car or while you're exercising. So Is I'm going to share meta- my metamorphosis thing. That's like constantly changing. No, no. Okay. Watch this. I'm going to share my screen here. And this new website called viscom.ai. Mm-hmm. And we'll open up this thing. What you do is you either draw or you upload a drawing and then it renders it out for you. So wow. here's my here's my what? original drawing of a little robot thing. Here's what it rendered for me. It's wow. perfect. Yeah. And you can dial up or down how much you want the drawing to influence it. So this is 100% drawing influence or, or 80 or 90%. This is like 75, 65, something like that. And you can see how much the computer or the AI is bringing to the drawing versus how much the drawing is, is bringing to it. I That's figured crazy. we'd do uh, we'd do it live right now so you guys can see. Is uh, that a camera in the future? Let me see some of these other examples. Are these okay, your, here's, here's are these your uploads? This, these are all my uploads. So this is wow. Little Bot, right? Mm-hmm. So here's the original drawing that I uploaded. Mm-hmm. And here's the render that it did. Wow. Um, you can see the, the original drawing is just like my scratchy, inky line work. And the, the render looks like a 3D model of it, kind of. Wow. It gets a little wonky in some of these. But serviceable, though. If you, I mean, you, if that's a 10-minute uh so you could update, actually you know, illustrate patch. in this 3D style by just knowing how to draw in 3D. Right. So let, here's another one. This is my chainsaw head robot. Um there's different uh, ver- variations. So this is the drawing I gave it. This is one of the renders it gave me, which is kind of like uh, it looks a little bit more, a little bit more painterly, maybe. It does, um, yeah. And then this Almost is looks like, the, a, like a Ryan Church from the yeah. Star Wars concept stuff. Um, I gotta say one thing about the functionality of Chainsaw Head Robot. Yeah. I feel like he would be a Darwin situation where he, he's like, all right, this is working really well. And he looks around and like cuts off his own arm. Yeah. So <laughs> cuts off the next chainsaw <laughs> robot's head or whatever. Uh, yeah. No, my robots don't. Now, have wait, to I got to ask you, did you get that <laughs> idea from the sawfish? No. Well, maybe, maybe in the back of my head. Uh, here's another drawing I uploaded. This is like a robot dog racer. Oh, and that's cool. Uh, it almost it, looks like cut paper or something. It didn't yeah. understand that hind foot. Yeah, so it cut a hole through the back. And here. also the where the foot is tangenting, mm-hmm. tangenting. Yeah, it's not sure what to do there. It didn't know what to do there. So it's not but, perfect. Let me see the drawing again. Oh yeah. Yeah, just like all just of AI. It's not perfect, there. but it's but it's Yeah. It's like better it than didn't most understand people that, could do. That cuz you you have a tangent, but we understand from a dog. We know what that is. Yeah, that foot coming down. It just shows you, though, you can't have tangents. It's it it like basically penalizes you for your tangent because it okay, doesn't. We're gonna understand upload. It. We're gonna upload a drawing here. Um, let's do. Uh, should we do like something like a character can design? I, like, can this? I give you one? What? Can you give me a drawing? Like a drawing? Yeah. Yeah, text me a drawing and I'll and I'll upload it. And while while I'm waiting for that, I'll I'll do the one that I I have okay. um I have ready here. So let's see here. It's an it's a little round assistant bot is what I call these things. It's like a little floating head robot. So right. you you upload the drawing. You can also draw right in the browser too. But you upload the drawing and then you type in what you need. We're gonna say um uh sh- shiny plastic. 
um, ball robot head, right? We're going to add right. a little bit of prompt there with it. And then we're going to say like um, black, no, no, dark gray components. Uh, I'm curious to see there's a, there's a little pull down bar called render style. And right now it's set to Viscom general. I want to see what that pull down bar. How do you spell is. components? Component. That's right. There's okay. No, yeah. So we're going to have drawing influence be hundred percent. We've got Viscom general. These are, there's, there's different options here. You could do automotive interiors. This primarily is designed to help like industrial designers. That's what it was. The model was built for. Right. Uh, we got volume render. We got pastel render and Technicolor six. We'll go through all of these to show you really quick. So let's oh, hit wow. generate. The little dots are spinning. It only takes 10 seconds probably to get there. Wait, what's wow. your thought on this while, while it's rendering? I mean, are you for it? Are you just kind of mesmerized by it and playing with it? What? Oh my goodness. Look at that. Okay, you guys, <laughs> it just rendered the most amazing. Oh my gosh. The most amazing render of this pretty clumsy crap ball drawing that Jake did. <laughs> I can't believe it. I cannot believe it interpreted it that well. Yeah. Yeah. So I, again, my ink drawing is like, uh, I took a small drawing and blew it up big. So it is kind of chunky and clunky. And it, but it's, it's interesting that it understands which plane goes where it does. Mm -hmm. I sent you an email. Okay. I am just totally blown away right now. That that is, I would have never in a million years thought that would be possible, with oh. what you're giving it versus what it's delivering. I mean, like regular AI, I almost understand more because you're giving it a prompt, uh, uh, you know, glowing lantern in a in a dark forest, and it just comes up with what it comes up with. You do not know what it's going to come up with, but this is <laughs> is is like matching your drawing exactly. Mm hmm. It's amazing. Do you want to see? Um, I want to see the wanna... pastel style. Okay. Well, let's do that. So we'll turn off this. We're going to switch from Viscom General to Pastel Render. This is where it, sometimes Pastel Render gets a little too, um, too artsy, kind of like the artistic filters in Photoshop. Yeah. Like, doesn't totally. Yeah. I don't, I don't know whether to be horrified or not. And <laughs> and it will add a background. This this one does add a background. Oh, it didn't oh, that's this time. So nice though. Yeah, this wow, looks more like cool. a two thousands Apple product. It yeah. does. It does like that candy iMac uh -huh, they used to have. Uh -huh. So oh there's that goodness. one. We'll that's we'll so confirm cool. that one. Let's try uh, volume render. I feel like all you of can, them are already pretty. You can also throw in the prompt. Yeah, you could say red. Or yellow, and it'll add. Oh. Those okay, okay. I have I have a question, or I have a suggestion. I want to see what Will's drawing is, but okay. my suggestion is like w w this caters to your style exactly. Like you're drawing robots and all this stuff, and it's mm -hmm. you know spitting them out like nobody's business. Um, God, that's pretty amazing too. Uh, but for like, if you were to enter in a, a forest or something like that, would it make like a mechanical forest, or what? What? What does it do then? Well, for let's, a landscape. Uh, let's check it out. We We'll do Will's first because he's got, um, he's going to have some kind of pickleball. No, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, he's got a, a crow here, like an illustrated crow is one of them and a hedgehog. Which should we do? Hedgehog first? I don't care. Whichever one you think we'll is more. Yeah, let's try the, try the hedgehog. Okay. So we got this oh, hedgehog. This will be good. This will be good. Okay. So what I'm doing is so it's, it's not like really a, drawn like yours. It's a little cute little hedgehog driving a car. Well, so it's we're not, the, the planes cute. aren't defined as a drawing. The planes are, are rendered but with value. And so I'm curious mm -hmm. to see how how it interprets that. While it's going, I'll have uh, I got a funny story. That, you guys ever listen to the Smartless podcast? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so somebody uh -huh. told me that that we, we're like the art version of that. It, except way less funny. <laughs> no, they said we're they said we're funnier. Okay, <laughs> which is which is good. I mean, of course, there are. I do. I I pop in and listen to those guys if they're interviewing somebody I care they're about. They're funny, man. Oh, they're it can't funny. do it. It Ooh. failed. What a fail! It dropped what the ball on Will's drawing. Fail! It like that's has a actually good snowball. <laughs> yeah, guys, see, that's though, what happened. Like when AI better came better out. Remember when I tried to get it like a, a kid running from a dinosaur? It morphed the kid and the dinosaur. What about the penguins? 
It turns this your smoke basically... behind the car into a hedge hedgehog texture. Yeah. yeah, or like a rabbit tail or something. Okay. I want to try changing the prompt on this really quick and okay. just seeing if if that can help it. Okay. I think I think we just found its limitation. It like it's good at mechanical stuff. It's like for an uh, for an automotive designer, this would be amazing. Or somebody designing some props for Star Wars like we were talking about. But um but Animal. for for but you guys are not projecting this this AI particular AI was fed car designs, industrial designs to help it. So someone could take the exact same engine, feed Fail. it, feed it a million children's book illustrations. Copyright and it violation. Would do exactly what we wanted to do. Hmm. Yeah. Hey, are so you, are you, another fail. Another okay, fail. What about the line work on those penguins? Okay, let's let's try that. Let me uh, let me. Because I wonder if it likes man, line I am work breathing better. a sigh of relief because it did Jake's so well and it's doing Will's so poorly. So bad. Yeah. See, you got to have Will in order to do Will. Anybody can do Jake. Any AI can do Jake. You know. That's right. Jake has been replaced, but me and Will still got our. <laughs> okay. still got our We've jobs. got uh, a bunch of penguins. We'll do dancing cartoon. Well, that's penguins. the dance I picture you doing when you win a pickleball tournament. Is that what you do? <laughs> the one in the lower right. <laughs> the one in the lower right. <laughs> I'm really curious if we're if we can break it with Will's nine. So Will has a grid of nine penguins. <laughs> It's not, not bad. Not that great. <laughs> not great. Not not what as terrible as the it? other one. It, it Zoom turned in. them into like plastic ghosts. <laughs> yeah, not <laughs> great. Not great, but not not a total fail. I'd I'd say it's it's adjustable. Cause see, it doesn't like Will added some volume lines. Mm -hmm. It doesn't know what to do with that. Uh huh. Yeah. We may think that's a plane uh, change. We're trying another sort of What's Technicolor six filter on it. Oh, it stuck them on a bookshelf. That's interesting. Interesting. Now watch this. We're going to do another thing. So watch what happens when you drop the drawing influence down to like 20, 15, oh. 15 or 20%. Now this is where it says, let's, let's do less of the drawing and let's do more AI. Okay. And here's what it's going to give us. It's going to, I think it's going to really astonish you. Here I tell go. you, while it's rendering, that's my my favorite part. Oh wow! Whoa! Wow! Wow! <laughs> wow! So what, what we're looking at here is essentially uh, not it my just drawing. Dis it disregarded your drawing entirely. Yeah. Pseudo. And go, can you do that again and go like sixty percent? Yeah, we can do that. This is what we're looking at here for for those of you who aren't on the YouTube. This is two penguins instead of nine penguins. Two harsh lighted uh, CG rendered penguins. Staring at each other, uh, semi-realistic. <laughs> Doesn't look anything well, like. Well, it's it's like a cart, uh, like animation realistic. You know, we're doing a seventy percent um, drawing influence. But what here. what I love yeah. about AI, let's start because we're bashing AI right now. But what I love about AI is that that one where it put the nine penguins on the bookshelf. Mm -hmm. That's what I like about AI because like you can enter it in, uh, and it can almost hint at something that you wouldn't have thought about. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, that's wild. Okay. So okay. Now. now. <laughs> we got nine penguins dancing on almost like a technicolor cake. Yeah. Um, with but in a, order with, to use this, you'd have to go in and completely paint. You'd have over. to know how to paint the whole thing anyway. You know, to, yeah. to this fix would be this. handy for like uh, lighting and and rendering, like a little thumbnail. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Not not too usable. What to is be that honest. thing on the right side? That. Yeah, like a tongue or something. I, it lo does look like a tongue. It's weird. It's and then so there's, a, there's a weird character that just popped out of nowhere. The red character to the lower left just popped yeah. out of nothing. They're just like, it looks like a, looks like a Play-Doh kind of cookie monster. Yeah. Well, Here's, for Jake's, um, I mean, it nailed it. It nailed the tech, tech, the technology kind of drawings. Wow. That's pretty cool. So this is, um, my, my kid uploaded this drawing, which is, uh, he drew, drew this little sketch from his sketchbook and, and I took a photo of it, cleaned it up a little bit. And it's a magician wearing with, with like a, a, a magic globe. What are these, those called? A, um, crystal ball, top hat, a crystal oh. ball for a head with a top hat and a cane. He kind of looks like the peanut in the peanut, uh, Mr. Peanut pose. And this is what it gave us. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. 
And then it gave Why us does it get... this. That's weird. That's really also cool. Pretty cool. So the what that's Will Terry lighting right there. Yeah. Uh-huh. What it's giving us is, is this is with less drawing influence, so it's it, it's making it more. He he's a really cartoony style. He has a really cartoony style, and what it's doing is it's giving us almost like a a photo of a of a tuxedo, a guy in a tuxedo, in the same proportions with a realistic crystal ball hat thing. It's really it's interesting. Pretty awesome though. Compared to the drawing, I mean, what I like about this is like. You could start with a really bad sort of doodle almost and then throw it in there. It's going to mm-hmm. give you a bunch of suggestions and then you could pick which one you like. And then, like I said, then start to do your own version of that. But that's what I like. Like I was saying earlier about the putting the penguins on the bookshelf is it, it sometimes suggests something so random that you're like, Hey, wait, that's a kind of a cool idea. And then you run with it, but it doesn't give you the, the version that the finished version, right? Unless you're Jake. And then it does actually give you, a finished version, <laughs> like a perfect oh, really cool. interpretation of Jake's drawing. I mean, somehow this is like aligning with your work one to one. It's well, and what I've been feeding it is more industrial design type of like when you right. can enter in and do a robot, it's like, Oh, we got robot. We know, we know right. what a robot looks like. It's in it's, um, it's in it's like, you know, it's in its zone when you enter. Yeah. If, let me sign out and you can see here, um, who, who they've been working with, um, to like develop this thing. So Scott Robertson, uh, mm. is one of the, one of the artists they've been like developing it with. And he's an automotive designer, essentially. He's, he's, um, he's from, you know, has this background of teaching automotive design at art center and, you could just see examples here of like it's really trying to cater to um, uh, a production type of environment for industrial design. Yeah, and I assume this is going to be a godsend for industrial designers. Maybe I don't know who need to to de- deliver fifty designs by Monday, and uh, and they all they have is sketches. They can just throw the sketches in, and it does the rendering for them. Well, yeah, it'll, and it'll be great for, you know, client presentation. I mean, that's really where this is because, because anybody who's in production can read the sketch and say, oh yeah, that's the right one. But yeah. other people that they are the money people that approve things, they mm-hmm. can't understand a sketch, but they can understand these finished cell renderings, you know. How'd you get your hands on this? Uh, I have some friends who are in the, who are just on the, the cusp of everything new and anything mm-hmm. Anytime they find something new, they just text it to me. God, my friends suck. Yeah. I don't have any friends like that that are we're on the, cu- the cutting edge. We're, you I'm guys your friends. Suck. I'm the one yeah, that brings, I, I, I bring it straight you're the to you only, guys. <laughs> You're the only one. <laughs> <laughs> my friends are still doing pastel drawings in the sketchbook. Like, your, your friends mock you. <laughs> okay, so really quick, I just want to, let's put our brains together, project where this is going to go. If this can do this today, what is going to be able to do what next year, five years? Mm-hmm. What do you think? It's a good question. I think that, I mean, I've been thinking this for a long time, that that uh, people are going to be able to convey their ideas much easier using AI for writing. Mm-hmm. And for it's already happening, and for um, illustrating, what it really comes down to I think is is creatively, can you come up with something that people want, and can you get it in front of them? Can you get can you get that thing that they can't uh, not have? So, for instance, I saw I don't know if you've seen this on on Facebook or on Instagram. It was on Instagram. And it's, it was really cleverly marketed, right? It mm-hmm. said, it said um, something like one of those gifts that that blew up um, Instagram that everybody had to have. Right. That was what hit me first, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm like curious, like, oh, what is the 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 gift item that everybody has to have? Have you seen that little? It's like little. It's like this little thing. It's probably like eight or ten inches high. And it's a waterfall of smoke. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've seen that one. Okay. They're stupid, but they're impulsive, right? 
Yeah. And I, even I was like considering like getting one for Lily because I'm like, it's always nice to have a gift tucked it's, away that yeah. I can whip out when I've forgotten that I need to get her a gift. Yeah. <laughs> that is something that she doesn't already have, right? Mm-hmm. And she loves stuff like that. And so what is it? What What is what appeals to people's nature is in that is people like something unique that they haven't seen before and people like waterfalls and it's it's this it's smoke making a waterfall so it's like you put these little modules in there that yeah that smoke and then they they're incense right so they right. have scent it's another thing to cl- clog up your countertop right when you really think about it yeah when you, do you remember when you're a kid you'd go into an aunt's house or something and there would be like a crocheted owl that like ha- there's like a stick oh yeah Two mm-hmm. sticks and like a crocheted owl in between, mm-hmm. and there's like wooden beads that make up the eyes and yeah. stuff. Um, that is like the 1970s version of this sort of thing, where it's like, here's a it's pattern, a you could do it yourself. It's in a magazine, yeah. people a download the pet. pattern, and and now it's a novelty making... thing that is an impulse buy, right? Yeah, um, and that's really it, what it comes down to. I think is there are people out there who don't have writing skills who don't have illustration skills, who are going to think of something like that, and they're going to use AI to write and illustrate it and make a book or a game or something that people just have to have because it's a creative, fun idea. And you, listener, with your skills in illustration and or writing, are going to be sitting there going, yeah, but they cheated. They used AI. And I have these skills. And they don't. Well, they beat you to market with a clever idea. Now they're making money doing it. Uh, that's an interesting question because, like, I've, I've talked to some other illustrators about that. Is our value in that our technical ability that we can do something hard, or no. is it in the finished product? And I, I think I agree with you, Will. Is that the we like the craft and tend to focus on the craft part of yeah. it so much that we end up the craft ends up being the 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 whole thing instead mm-hmm. of the finish, which it is a good thing. To be. It's changing. Right. I'll, 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 re, I'll go back to my story that I've told here before with outing Jim Madsen, who we all love. I hope he gets to hear this again, but I came up with that, that, that video that I put on YouTube where I played the, the brushes backwards using the, on Photoshop, using an mm-hmm. eraser. Right. <laughs> and I made these fake brushes for Photoshop that basically this was 10 years ago. I didn't know about AI art. There wasn't no, there wasn't on the horizon for us at all then, at least for me. And I was like, what if someone came up with a brush that was magical that just like did the rendering for you? So I mm-hmm. had my my painting in layers and I just erased the layers off, pretending it was a brush and then played it backwards. So it looked like I was painting those layers on and I made a video and Jim, who's an amazing painter in Photoshop, saw it. And, and luckily, you know, cause we're friends and all. And he was like, he was so mad that something like that existed so for a split second. I had him, you know, for, mm-hmm. for like a couple of minutes before the other people in his office were like, this is a joke. This is not real. He was so upset that his skill set was going to be undermined by technology. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and now it's here. <laughs> I think you're right, though, that um, the, the the artists or the creator's main problem moving forward isn't going... And, and actually, honestly, it's been the problem for 10 years now. And that isn't um, uh, overcoming the hurdles to create something. It's the big hurdle to overcome is uh, the, the hurdle of obscurity. Mm-hmm. Like how do you stand out? And how do you rise above the noise? Um, and, and that's only going to get worse with more noise being put out there. Uh, I think what people's eyes are also going to adjust to and, and tastes are going to adjust to AI to the point where, you know, it's not going to look as flashy. I think it's going to be maybe, uh, it could, you know, unless AI can, can stay ahead of like people's tastes. Right. But the problem with AI is, is now it's being fed itself, Right. So I don't know how 
AI can evolve if it's just being fed itself. And so when someone creates something truly unique that couldn't be made by AI, AI hasn't gotten there yet. And so that can stand out, right? So I, I think it does come down to your main job as a creator isn't making art. It's solving a problem. Can you creatively solve a problem? Amen. There was an art director I remember a long time ago. Um, do you remember the uh, Communication Arts Awards annuals? Yeah. Remember yeah. when those would come out? Uh, there was an art director who got into the photography uh, award annual. And he had taken, he had no technical ability, but he did some thumbnail sketches. And then, you know, he, he was an art director, so he knew a bunch of photographers. So he brought a photographer out on location and they, back then there was no digital film, so they would shoot Polaroids before they would shoot actual film to get a, just a sense of what it was going to be. And they, the photographer kept shooting enough Polaroids. He'd say, no, I want it to be look bigger. And the, so the photographer would then switch to a wide angle lens. Now the art director didn't say switch to a wide angle lens, use this F stop, you know, all the photography stuff. Yeah. He would just say, I want it to be brighter over here. I want it to be bigger or smaller, crop different or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then the, the photos ended up winning awards. And the question was, who's the photographer? Right. And mm -hmm. the argument was the art director was the photographer pressed the buttons but yeah, the, the art director was the, the photographer. The technical skills, but wasn't bringing the art, the art correct, eye correct. to it. Right. And so it was, it was a really interesting moment. And I see that sort of coming back, that same kind of context coming back. Um, I think the problem is that it's like at the, it, using that analogy, the art director really was guiding what happened. He found the location. He brought the person there, said, I want a picture of this that looks like this. But with right. AI, you can say, I want a, a really, you know, crazy forest scene that's on a, on a mountain. And then, right. but you don't really know what it's going to look like. And then right. it shoots it out there and you're like, oh, that's awesome. And so that's my only problem with it is it's solving problems in a way that's it's driving instead of the creator a little mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you, are you making too many compromises with your vision? To use AI, that and that's one reason why I haven't gone down that rabbit hole. Is I feel like I know what I want, and I like the process that I use to get there. However, if I were younger today, and I know that a lot of people are probably going to hate that I'm going to say this, but if I were younger and I were starting out, I probably would definitely be finding out how to use AI. Well, I know there's a whole coalition of artists out there who were against AI. They're but. stogies though. They're older. I bet they're old school. How many artists, I'm just going to ask this question. I know we won't have an answer for it, but how many artists under say the age of 35 are using AI in some part of their process, if not all of their process? And are willing to admit it. Well, and here's I don't the think thing. anybody's willing to admit it. I don't want to throw him under the bus, but I was talking to a professional artist friend of mine the other day. And he sent me an image and I was like, dude, this is so cool. This is like, this is, this is really a step up from your previous designs. And he's like, thanks. And I could tell it was hundred percent him, but I noticed uh, a color combo that I'd never seen him do before, but mm -hmm. it was a color combo I had seen in a lot of mid journey um, images, right? And I didn't want to say anything. And he's like, yeah, I used Mid Journey to help come up with the concept. And then separate from Mid Journey, he went in and made a full, you know, design, essentially using the Mid Journey concept that he created as a uh, thumbnail, right? Mm -hmm. As like, I'm just referencing that. And now I'm, I'm making my design. And, and I was like, I knew it. I could tell that that color combo was something that um, it's, it's, it was, it's a little more trendy than the other stuff that he'd, he'd done previously. And mid journey does what's trendy because um, that's what it's been told it should do. Right. And so essentially what he made was a brand new piece that looks very contemporary and very cool, but it's uh, it was uh you know, the, all the final drawing and everything was him. And I, he didn't show me what his mid journey prompt was. He has a more graphic style. And I know mid journey comes up with more painterly style if, if you need. And so he's translating this painterly 
thumbnail rendered image to his more graphic style and it just looks super cool and and uh and it i think it helped him level up a little bit right Mm-hmm. Um, that's how, that's how I see, that's where I see the big benefits. I mean, that's how I, I'm referencing color on AI. I can't get the AI to do anything in terms of making an image like I make really. Right. But, um, but in terms of color balance, I'm looking at mid journey a ton. Cause it's great at that. It's great at lighting. Like Will was saying with that one that we saw, right. uh, it's great at color and it's great at value, um, control. So to be critical of that, I would, you could say that, well, uh, Mid Journey is trained on artwork that it did not, it does not have the rights to be trained on technically. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if he's using, not using the free version, if he's paying Mid Journey, then there's money going to a company that is essentially using stolen art to give him these ideas, right? Um, the equivalent would be let's say he didn't use Mid Journey, but he went to Pinterest and said, okay, I need an image that looks like this and he makes a, a a board of images you know 20 images right and he kind of says this is the vibe i want to go for my piece and then he makes a piece based off of those images well you might say okay well yeah i mean those pieces were posted on on pinterest but were they posted on pinterest with that art those artists permission and pinterest makes a ton of billions of dollars selling advertising space so while you're surfing pinterest you're seeing the ads they're making all the money. You're essentially giving your artwork for free or or uh, without permission to be used in the same way that this mishmash of a thing has been put together through Mid Journey. So it gets very blurry. It gets very gray. But I kind of feel like there's similarities there. If you're opposed to using Mid Journey, you should probably be opposed to using Pinterest. And you yeah, should. But then just you're operating create, in a vacuum. Yeah, and you should just create too. in a vacuum. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's weird. A side side question: Um, is there? A, I remember you talking about a way to turn off the ads in Pinterest. Is that is that a thing? Can you do that? Yeah, so you can use an ad blocker. It doesn't work on the app, but it works on the browser version. I have found yes. though that when it's running, Pinterest crashes, and it never did mm. that before I ran it. So you'll be surfing through Pinterest, you'll be looking at it, and then all of a sudden, this website can't load anymore. It's yeah, worth it to, to get rid of the fresh. ads because I'm. That's the one thing. I, a long time ago, I didn't understand how I, I knew we were transitioning to an information age. I just didn't know how it would play out. Like what information am I going to pay for? And now I find myself buying all these services to eliminate ads and it is 100% worth the money. <laughs> what ads and and that's just a weird get? version get of ads of, on Pinterest. You don't yeah, get you ads do. on Pinterest? No. Yes, you do. You have to. I mean, and what's so distracting about them is they're the ones that are video based. Yeah. So they're moving and flashing while I'm trying to look for a better artist than myself so I can level up. <laughs> yeah, just, I, just, if you use Chrome, just get an ad. What's that? You don't. Oh, there's a lot of white spaces. Share your screen. Okay. Let's see what your Pinterest looks like, Will. Look at my Pinterest right here. Are you using an ad blocker, Will? I don't think so. It just looks like that. There's, yeah, there's you're white using spaces. an ad blocker. Oh, okay. yeah, those would be ads. Well, that yep. I'd much rather see that. Did you were you always wondering why there's uh, blank spaces yeah. on your Pinterest? That's well, you know what's funny about Will myself. I'm not a techno guy. You know what's I don't funny know about what's Will's on. Pinterest is like you know just like you were saying, show somebody their, their life and you'll show you you show somebody your in, your Pinterest page and I'll show them your artistic style. <laughs> like these are all Pinterest sort page? of round, sort of rounded characters. <laughs> they all look like a ball with eyes, and uh, and then that's Will Terry right there yeah. in a nutshell. <laughs> That's so oh, funny. There's some AI stuff in there too. That cat's totally AI. Which, Which one? one? So you're you you're part of this where you can tell how can you tell that's AI? I can't tell that's AI. I um, mean it's I can when you zoom in and but I wouldn't yeah, pick it at the out paw. like you did. No one no artist would do the paw like that. Scroll up, Will. Okay. Oh. Okay, now here's yeah. a question for you guys. This is again going back to AI ethics. They're not, they're posting it and they're not saying, oh, this is Pinterest, not Instagram. So, but I've seen a lot of people posting on Instagram Looks and like AI I know too. it's AI and they're saying, Hey, little painting I did. That's, is that ethical? That's lame, no, right? No. Guys, if you're using AI, just say, if if you're posting an AI image, just say it's, it's a, <laughs> here's something I typed words in. 
and made. Yeah. <laughs> look, at, look at how many people are giving them kudos. And then this one person out of like 50 that says, is this AI? Yep. That's what I, I did that yesterday on Instagram to this watercolors. Cause I knew one image was AI. It stood out from all the rest. And I said something and she was so horribly offended. And I was like, I'll stand by it. I know it's AI. Um, yeah. Sh- just, show me your sketches. Show me all the work that led up to it. Well, that's, a, uh, that's the point I wanted to make. Uh, that's why I'm recording my process and I'm showing the whole thing on Instagram, either clips of me painting or the whole painting. Okay, Will, let me show you my Pinterest page. How do, I do you think that's a good thing to do, you guys? Just steal it. At this point, to show your process? Call. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or calling people out on it. What are you doing, Will? I don't know how to get out of this. Oh, let me... Just uh, steal it. Let me steal it from you. Steal the... Uh, which one are you? Uh stop sharing. There you go. I don't know why you can't share like that. Okay. So I'm going to share my Pinterest page and you tell me if this represents me at all. This is embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Cause it is, I mean, it's, it's exactly the thing that, yeah. you know, it's en- yep. enough of the things yeah, that we're interested in. We've got spaceships, we've got robots, we've got Mayan sculptures, yeah. we've got like canyons with bridges over them we've got like cars my stuff my stuff always shows up on pinterest when i'm looking for things so in those white spaces there'd be like flashing ads yeah so if i turn off my my ad blocker here if you want to see that we'll we'll uh pause on this site and then hit refresh and now i'm getting uh get this toothbrush shop at sam's Uh, club um get your listerine going uh here's some some protein (laughs) pancakes hamburgers you know get a deal on on the whopper uh (laughs) no thank you okay let me turn that back on before i get super frustrated there's some ice cream up there with caramel sauce okay so okay we actually have a question that has to do with what you, you just said, Will. And it comes from Raj. He is, he's been showing up in the comments a lot on the YouTube channel. Uh, mm-hmm. He's been showing up to our live streams as well, our How to Fix Your Art live streams. Subject question is, starting from scratch, uh, I have a hypothetical question for you all. If you had to start over with no audience and no body of work, but with all the knowledge you have now, how would you go about it? What would be the first step? How would you approach social media having zero followers? Would you bother with traditional publishing? Basically, how would you restart your career and would you? Lee, that's a good question because you practically have zero followers. So um... <laughs> I know exactly 20, what my answer is would be. zero to Jake, you guys. <laughs> I messing. have an answer for that. But yeah, I'll let's let hear it. Lee well, go first if you no, want. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I need to think about it. I was busy now, looking at my is, Pinterest page. This is, um, <laughs> I don't believe it's, you can actually do this answer this question completely you can answer it honestly but you can't answer it as if it were real because no will i don't have the wolves i don't have the wolves chasing me right now you know what i mean so don't do that thing where well if i were you i would have bought apple stock 20 years ago i'm not doing that (laughs) but what i think (laughs) is this knowing what i know now okay um i would not I and this is partly my personality. I wouldn't play the traditional publishing game, and here's why. And mm-hmm. it's the reason why I never really played it for my writing is I don't like the idea of working really hard on something and having someone else be able to say, "I'm not even going to let the market <clears throat> decide whether they like it or not," because I don't like it. You know, so it's my dream. They shoot it down, and then I got to go work on another dream. So for me, when I work on a dream, I want the market to be able to have a chance to look at it. I want people to be able to vote with their dollars. That's just my personality. Some mm-hmm. people are good at writing a story, submitting it, getting, you know, nothing happens. Their agent's like, eh, you know, and then they write another story and they write another story. And they're, and that's their, it fits in their personality. So part of this is that that just doesn't fit in mind. So what I would do different today, knowing what I know now, is I would get a job doing something I don't hate to make money to pay the bills. 
Mm-hmm. So I would have kind of like a career um, mm-hmm. doing something not art related. And then in my spare time, I would try to figure out how to realize dreams as basically being an inventor. I mean, like, like every single thing that you, you like out there that you, that you consume was someone's dream, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, everything that we, all of our possessions, all of the, the entertainment we consume, the vacations, the food, everything, you know, I'm, I'm seeing these really creative sweet shops popping up, you know, in -hmm. our area. And it's like, someone's trying to invent a better way of delivering a donut or a cookie or right or something. And they're really creative. And I look at them and I'm like, man, that looks like fun. You know, like there's, there's things we're creators. We're creative people. I would try to figure out the things that really do it for me. And then I would try to bring it to market. And when you go to a comic convention, you see the people that are struggling that have nine to fives mm-hmm. and they're there with their baby and not just a comic convention, any convention, right? Mm-hmm. And they've got their thing they've been working on in their spare time, and they're they're trying to get it out in the world. I would be doing that. I would have something yeah. that I just really believe in, and I would be going for it as an entrepreneur. Well, you essentially took the the words right out of my mouth. If I were to, if I were you today, I would first things first be learning valuable skills that are going to make you um, easily hireable. And how do you know what skills those are? You go on any job board for any, um, this is if you want a a creative job, go to any job board and look at what they're hiring, what jobs are available. And it's going to be a lot of like, there's going to be like some technical jobs where it's lighting for video game or it's environment design for video game. And a lot of that involves like, modeling, learning how to model in 3D, learning the Photoshop or the the Adobe suite, all those kinds of things. Or if it's in graphic design, it's like being proficient at Illustrator, being proficient at InDesign. So you're just going to go and get a, a, a really good skill set of valuable skills that, uh, that, that people need. And then you're going to get a job doing one of those things. Okay. Now, the nice thing about a job is it does not a good job, I guess, is it does not come home with you is you go in, punch a clock. They got a cereal bar you have, or a coffee bar or something like that. Yeah. You hang out, you get to work, you go to a couple meetings, you clock out at the end of the day and you don't have to worry about that thing until nine o'clock the next morning. Right. And that gives you 16 hours at home between your commute and between uh, you know, between the two commutes, 16 hours essentially to, uh, or, 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 you know, for being less generous, 10 hours, right. Where you get to sleep and put in some time to a hobby or put in a time to, uh, um, learning your craft or something like that. Right. Um, you could also take lunch breaks to work on that stuff as well. But like Will said, uh, then you, you put some time in, uh, weekends and on evenings and on lunch breaks and mornings or whatnot into your, your project. And you don't worry about you, you, you sort of practice slow productivity and you focus more on quality than busting out a ton of content, right? Um, you don't want to be a part of the content problem where there's too much for people to consume really is going to rise to the, to the top is very excellent, high quality stuff. And if it takes you two years to make it, that's way better than spending two years making 10 lower quality things, I think. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, again, also practice finish, not perfect. Right. The, the key is to finish something, but to get it to a level where it's, it looks good and it's presentable and, and you get it there. Then you're going to come out with this stuff and, People are so focused on their own lives, but also the, the, the stream of content that's coming to them that I don't, I think when something truly accept, accept, exceptional shows up, it, uh, it, will, it will make them pause and, and, and take notice. And I think you, you do that on the side. And if that picks up and if that takes off and it, 
is making equivalent to what you're doing for your day job, then you can switch to that full time. But if it doesn't, you still have like this job where you're involved creatively and you're involved in projects and you're making things. And I think that's just fine as well. Right. Um, so I think that's, I think that is the, the, the best approach right now. The main problem is we're going into a, 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 a this high inflation economy situation, right. Mm-hmm. Coupled with too much content, right. So people have less money, but they also have more stuff to like consume than ever before. So if you are an indie artist who is trying to do like a children's book or is trying to do your own comic or is trying to do like your own indie video game or or whatever it is, the discretionary income that used to be available to you 10 years ago is less available to you now. People are not going to spend as much money at a con. They're not going to spend as much money at a comic shop or whatever. But there are some staples that they are going to spend their money on. And I should say like uh, uh, discretionary staples. Like if a new Zelda game comes out, chances are they're going to spend money on that versus buying 20 independent comics, right? Or, Or five children's books or whatever like that, you know? So it might make sense to be a part of a company that is less inflation proof where you know that your income is going to be a little bit more standard during this, these years of, of inflation and and possibly recession or whatnot. And to not have to stress out so much about, um, your income resting totally on an algorithm that can change at the whim of a hat. Is that, is that how the saying goes? (laughs) (laughs) You're not going to be stressed out about, um, uh, you know, cancel culture, like so you, you, you saying something and, and now, you know, people aren't going to, to, to support your work. You're not going to be stressed out about, um, uh, you know, a shift in, you know, somebody buys the platform that you're very active on and you're getting a lot of traction on and they ruin it. And now you have no more traction on that platform. So you have to go find another platform and grow your work on. Um, You're not worried about all these things that are out of control. You sort of just show up, you get a paycheck and then you come home and you can work on your thing without pressure of it being successful or not. Mm -hmm. That's That's what I, yeah. Yeah. That's what I like is you don't have the pressure the, one of the one of the problems it, it's it's a double edged sword. So, you know, the Lion Decker credo was spend more than you make, so that you have this this uh, hunger to work really hard and make more, right? Yeah, Dave Ramsey. And I think that. that works for some personalities, but it doesn't mm-hmm. work for everybody. It didn't work for me. What I ended up doing was substandard work. You know, because you're over you're overselling. To, you're just trying order. to get every piece of work you can. You're not really focused, and you're not really able to have a long term vision. You're just kind of getting what's out in front of you. Mm-hmm. You know, picking up the jobs that are there, whether they fit you or not. You're taking them because you need the money. You have to. Yeah, yeah that's that was me early on. And the thing that I've been jealous of some people, and why I say I'd probably do it differently now if I was starting out, is to have that time where. You're, you work a job, but then you can tinker and mm-hmm. basically be an inventor or creator on your own time, working on the thing that you love. And whether it makes it or not, it doesn't matter. You're doing something that you love. And <clears throat> chances are the world's going to love it even more because you're going to put even more time and effort into it. And now you can use AI tools to write and illustrate where where you need writing and illustrating. And um I think we need to think of ourselves more like Andy Warhol did than, than some, a lot of the bigger, um, you know, artists that had elves that had, you know, people they hired to work for them. That's really mm-hmm. what, how artists are using AI now. Right. Except you don't have to pay the AI. I want to hear what Lee said, what Lee thinks. Yeah. What was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> what would you do starting different? today? Um, well, let me comment on what you guys are saying. Just, just real quick. It's funny because we get a lot of people, 
uh, we've mentioned this on the show before, but people idealizing what a being a professional artist is. And what you guys are talking about is totally different. You're talking about a position that a lot of people already have. Like they email in and they're like, oh, I'm a medical assistant, but I really want to be a professional illustrator full time. And a lot of people already have this situation that you're sort of describing Mm -hmm. and they don't know it. And so it's kind of, I just want to point that out because, Mm -hmm. you know, for our listeners, you may be in a spot that's actually more ideal for you than switching over and trying to, being a professional artist is hard. I mean, it's even still hard now. We were talking, Will and Jake and I were talking about that the other day, that you still got to fight for a budget that is shrinking. You still got to fight for a a job in a pool that's now bigger um, for you to get it. It's just, it's just really, really hard. Um, I... I think if I was starting now with the knowledge that I have now, I would think carefully and slowly instead of just producing so much work, Uh like I see so many people doing and I find myself doing it too. stop and just say, what am I doing? Why am I making this thing? And, and what am I trying to accomplish with it? And I'm sort of at that crossroads, strangely enough, again, after 25 years of it, I've, much of my agent's chagrin, I guess is that the right <laughs> word, frustrations. I, I just wrote it and illustrated a dummy that we pitched and it didn't get bought. And I found myself very frustrated at somebody having to approve it after I've done so much work on my own. And I just put either with prints or art fairs or self-publishing like my tarot deck and stuff. I have such joy doing that because I know it's going to come out like what Will was saying. And then all of a sudden to be told no kind of mm-hmm. bugged me in in a way because I think uh, in order for a book to sell nowadays it has to appeal to a lot of people it has to appeal to a I don't want to say lowest common denominator but a common denominator and you know I don't need my books to appeal to 30,000 people I if if 500 people like my book and I make something that's for them mm-hmm. I'm happier than if I make some generic thing that, uh, that pleased the the masses. You know, I don't want to make, right. I don't want to make, if I was a musician, I wouldn't want to make music like, you know, just pop hits that aren't, that everybody likes. Like you don't want to be David Hasselhoff in Europe. Remember how, how, how big he was? <laughs> Unless reason. you do want to be David Hasselhoff but then, but in then Europe. Then maybe you Sounds do. like a sweet gig. <laughs> but, okay. So, so after I got rejected on this thing, I found myself going back saying, I don't know if I want this version anymore. I feel like this version is an outdated thing where I've got to pitch it. And then they say, you know, I work on it for a long time. I love the idea of the book and I love the dummy. And then I pitch it and they're like, "Mm." some people, some people said it's too scary. Some people said it's too independent. Some people said it's too commercial. I got everything, every review you could possibly get that was, and they were all inconsistent, which means they're just making, they're just talking. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm I'm back. I'm talking to my agent and he's like, okay, well, let's write another dummy and pitch it. And I'm like, wait, I'm going to do that again? That's That was terrible. Right. Why don't I just p- illustrate this book? Then, so I'm, then now I'm back to where I was saying a second ago, I just got to stop and say, do I want to make this book on my own? Do I want to do uh, another dummy for the publishing industry, um, which I'm reluctant to do? Um, or, I, or, or I've stopped art fair since the, uh, since COVID hit. And that was really fun because that became, when you do your own thing, you have to find the vehicle to sell the thing. Making the thing's not the hard part. Selling Mm -hmm. the thing is the hard part. Mm -hmm. So you got to figure out where that distribution is. For me, a long time ago, not a long time ago, but pre-2020, was was art fairs. I would sell books and prints and original paintings. And it was a very good side business. Um, And when I say good, it it generated between 60 and and 150,000 a year. And now I'm not doing that because I just haven't gone back since COVID. And so I find mm-hmm. myself having these conversations with my wife, like, do I want to do that? Do I want to do the books on my own? And so what model of this do I want to do? And so, so that would be my advice knowing going back, you know, I said it a few weeks ago on the podcast, you can do anything you want, but you can't do everything that you want. Right. And so you got to pick it. And so I'm sort of at that stage now. And that's what I would spend more time instead of constantly trying to feed Instagram or, make mm-hmm. work. So people think I'm busy. I don't know. I don't know. Um, 
that's what that's sort of the mindset that social media brings to me is I feel like I'm feeding it kind of like coal going into a fire. <laughs> and yeah. if the fire goes out, I just don't like that feeling. So, so kind of backing up and taking these moments, maybe every couple of years, maybe every year even, and just stop like two weeks, no work. You're just looking at your life and saying, okay, which direction am I going? And what am I making for that? Mm-hmm. Is it something that stuck out in there that's unrelated? All the stuff you said was good. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, go ahead. It was kind of a mic drop, so I don't really need to go there. But but what you said um, something about how uh, editors will say no. No, not the Hasselhoff thing. <laughs> Although I would I would be jealous. To, I would love SpongeBob to jump from one leg of mine to the other. <laughs> but that would be cool to have that in your resume. Um <laughs> No, but uh, you said, uh, you know, editors just turn you down. And I, I mentioned the same thing. And have you noticed that they don't, like, they all said different things, right? Mm-hmm. Which means they don't really know what it is. They really just are trying to tell you they don't like it. I, and right. you wish they would say, you know what? I don't like your book. And I don't know why. It's just not gripping me. It's not, yeah. I don't think I could sell it. I don't think I could pitch it. I don't think it's exciting enough. I don't think it's original enough. I don't think it's something. It doesn't have that X factor, whatever it is. But they can't say that. So they make up something to give you a reason so you'll just go away. And you go away going, what? I think that's true to some extent, but I don't agree with you in this particular instance mm. um, because they were so detailed in the discussion it, they would say why they didn't didn't like it, mm-hmm. and then they would be very detailed in in the sort of description and and thoughtful responses. So I believed them with what they were saying, mm-hmm. um, but but didn't you say they were all different? Yes, and and and, and I I think that's valid too. I think all things can be true at the same okay. time through the lens of of whatever publisher it is or what they're looking for, and so my concern with pitching in the traditional way is that it's really a needle in a haystack. They have to be looking for this kind of book right. and then you submit the book and it lands right. on their desk at the right time. So this, this, you know, That's mm-hmm. a big, serendipitous thing yeah. has to happen. And I don't see that as being as likely anymore, especially if you're making, if you're making interesting content, the content is not for everybody. Right. Yeah. I, and, and really what they should be saying is this is not a book that we know how to sell. Right. 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 And, and, or, or, and so then, then it's like, then you go into that dance where you find the publisher that's publishing the type of thing that you're doing. And then you say, I've got a book right for you. Like, or, or find the editor that's doing the kind of stuff. I've got a book for you. And then you might have a better chance of getting maybe but because. but when you can when you can just do it on your own anyway. And like yeah. Will said, let the market decide. Why do, why do you want to court that? chance when you can make the thing and here's my here's my logic there this is a totally up uh, now we've gotten off topic but but if they knew what they were doing why would why was harry potter kind of a, a, a turned down a, 13 times right yeah industry changing book i mean a worldwide <laughs> industry changing book this turned down so if they knew what they were doing that should have been snatched up the first person who saw it's like oh my god big hit but they didn't right. know it and, and here's, i think a here, lot of times they don't know it but here's you expose my another problem, problem. Hold oh, on, let me just go. go th- this is the American Idol problem or the uh, America's Got Talent or whichever country you're in has talent that show mm-hmm. you guys know. Sometimes the people really do suck and they think they're good. Mm-hmm. And, the, and, and so if you're going to go the self-made route, how do you guarantee that you're not that person? The person who can't sing, who's up there belting out a Whitney Houston song? Right. So I, I don't know. There's a little, there's a problem I, with any model. I'll say this against the uh, traditional publishing model too. The, one of the big problems you're up against is if you're creating something that's totally fresh and original, there's mm-hmm. no genre for you. There's no precedent. They can't look up other books because that's what they do in acquisition meetings. They look, they look up other books that are similar to see what this, how, how it was received to see the sales numbers. And so sometimes books get, that's how a Harry Potter gets turned down. Mm-hmm. Right, it's it's, un, it, it's sort of uncharted it's territory, unprecedented. So, let's say you're creating something that's just amazing, and you get told no. And how many of those dreams did people just put on the shelf and go back to work and just kind of forget about? Mm-hmm. And and that's it's really frustrating. The other thing I was going to ask you, Lee, is were they right? Did you like? Was there any truth ringing in your ears when they 
gave you the criticism? Did you agree with it? I didn't agree with it. And I, and I, I'm not at the stage of my career where I'm precious with my work. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm comfortable saying, Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. That's not, didn't hit the mark or, you know, admitting like, Oh wow, that's a good point. I, mm -hmm. I didn't think any of it was valid. I think, Oh, okay. I think kids are, are, are smarter than uh -huh. a lot of publishers give them credit for. And I think they, I think they have a, a wider tolerance for different kinds of fun stories. And mm -hmm. I think I'm going to go ahead and throw this out, throw publishing industry under the bus. They become about as much fun as a, as a, I don't want to bump on a log. I mean, they're, they're, they're looking for, in my opinion, YA themes, but now for five-year-olds. Yeah. And so it just wasn't important enough. I mean, like they're looking for social issues and racial issues and, and, and these big, these big topics that I'm not sure I want to read my kid and, and, and they're rejecting things that are just fun, silly things. Like would, would pigeon doesn't, uh, don't let pigeon drive the bus. Would that yeah. get published now? I don't know. I mean, I think I it's, think there was a, a climate when we were growing up that books could just be fun for fun's sake. And the idea of getting kids to read was the goal. So it's like, we don't care what you're reading just as long as you're reading. Mm -hmm. Now it's, now it's reading plus an agenda. That is, um, that's where I think graphic novels are at. There's a lot of fun graphic novels. I, I want to test that theory because I, I was at a Barnes and Noble last week and I went to the children's section and, you know, everything was like Halloween and fall type of stuff. And I did mm -hmm. see a lot of fun books like that facing out in their, mm -hmm. in that section. And I thought, oh, these are cool. These are fun. But I didn't mm -hmm. check to see when the publishing date was on all of them. It could be that well, it's not an absolute either. It's like, I guess what I'm saying is the agenda is creeping in. So mm -hmm. like, let, let's say you had, you know, a thousand books being published and a thousand of them were fun for fun's sake. Well, maybe now it's 700 or fun or 600 or 500 or 400. I don't know. I would say the you fun know? is the anomaly now. It's not the, yeah. it's not the, it's the exception. Um, it's a little bit different in our conversation again, but you know, yeah, I don't know. We want to go into that can of worms, but that was a really good question from Raj. Yeah, yeah, big one. I, that would be uh, a fun question to ask online, like on social media, and get everybody kind of weighing in on that. Yeah, it would be. I'll tell so, you this: just go. And, let me just bring up one more point that everybody's scared to talk about that this topic that we're sort of lightly tiptoeing into. We had an art director on the on the the show at some point, and we asked some of these questions, and and they. The industry, industry people clam up pretty quick. They don't want to talk about this stuff. And they nope. go, we got one of them that gave us a great answer and then called later and said they don't want to air that answer. That was an agent. Was, oh, was it? Yeah, yeah, I can't remember who. I thought that was a, a publishing person. But yeah, or, I mean, was or it, an art director. It, I can't you're remember. Just not, yeah, you're just not even supposed to ask the mm -hmm. questions that we're talking about. And, and, Yet it's the it's driving the whole industry. It's it's kind of I kind of bizarre. love asking tough questions and trying to get answers. I asked the question. I know Jake, you're trying to get in here. No, you go ahead. <laughs> I asked this question of someone that I that I really respect. I still really respect them, and I don't want to out them. They worked in the education, you know, in, in the college education in, in an illustration program, and I said, "How come we're not teaching?" Uh, animation students the truth about what it what it is like when you get a job in animation and what the pay is like and what the layoffs are like and what the, right, the, the cost load, of living of is like in the places where you get those jobs and his response was why would we want to do that <laughs> and i and i realized right then and there that the money you pay for a, a higher education in, in a lot of, in a, in a, in a, in a, in one sense is a waste of time is a waste of money because if you're not going to get truth there, who can you trust? You know, mm -hmm. it's frustrating. It's very frustrating. We talk so much about the craft and everything, but, but the reluctance to talk about the ability to make a living and what kind of living you make is, is kind of taboo even from us, even for us to really dive into all the stuff we're talking about here. Maybe we should have a, uh, you guys, for the listeners, love to hear your opinion on whether we should go deep dish on all this stuff <laughs> and see, and just, just, uh, just run it and, and, uh, 
and see what happens because there's a certain level of, um, like I said, tiptoeing around these subjects that nobody wants to talk about how it really works, but we're all dealing with it when we make decisions on, Hey, I'm going to, am I going to pitch this to a publisher? Or am I going to self publish? And what kind of stuff am I going to make? Um, <clears throat> it dictates it, it, it has a one-to-one relationship with that. So anyway, sorry, let's go, go on to the next question. No, I think we, I think we filled our time. So we'll do that. We'll call that an episode. We'll, we'll hit the other two questions next time. Hey, Which we are got really one question. We are too. getting long winded. Well, the first half was AI. The second half was what do you do now with your career? You know, where, where do you go? What, what should you do? I think I think they go together. They do. It's a, it's a nice, nice tight episode. I think we got here. Yeah. So I'll take us out. A little sketch done. A little sketch done. And we got some drawing done. <laughs> That's great. We're gonna do one drawing per episode now. <laughs> if you made it to this point in the episode, try to guess uh, what Lee's drawing was. <laughs> no, we'll do a, just put an emoji in there. We're going to say, do the, uh, since you went the distance with us, do the running emoji. Okay. That's a good one. Running emoji. Uh, all right. Every, everybody, thank you for joining us. Uh, Three Point Perspective is made possible by SVS Learn. We're becoming a great illustrator starts. Your hosts are Will Terry, Jake Parker, and I'm Lee White. No, wait. Will Terry, <laughs> Lee White, and I'm Jake Parker. You can find us on Instagram. You can find us on YouTube. We're on a bunch of the socials. Just do a little Google search for our name. Uh, special thanks to our podcast producer, Daniel Tu. That's Daniel T-U. You can find his work at daniel2.co. Special thanks to our show notes wrangler, Lily Howell, for all the great show notes that she puts into these episodes. Thank you to the people who uh, have been sending us in questions. And uh, we're happy to take some some new questions. We're getting a little bit to the bottom of the the barrel here. Of course, we do take a bunch of good questions from our Patreon. Those ones get answered pretty quickly. But if you're not a member of the Patreon, you can send us a question over at uh, svslearn.com. Just click on the podcast button. And there's a little, little button there where you can uh, enter in a question, send it to us. Uh, I think that's it for us today. Now, go draw something. Anyway, okay, so so for our listeners, if this banter makes it in, we are talking about things you do in your life. And Will's uh, my a, contention a is hypothesis. That you, you do what you love, even if you say you hate doing it. Mm-hmm. It's, our you really our context is they're they're making fun of me because I'm remodeling my condo, as we've talked about mm-hmm. the past month, and I don't love it. But yes, I'm forced to buy because I don't have a ton of money. I'm forced to buy the worst. My philosophy is buy the worst thing in the best area. The fixer upper. Mm-hmm. You have to. It's the only way to add value it. to it. No, but you don't love it because it, it, you go to bed at night with a smile on your face. You're like, oh, ooh, I got this deal. <laughs> I got it. I'm gonna go up there and I'm gonna fix it up and I'm gonna rent it out. And now here's the thing. Things. Here's the thing. The reason that I don't think that's true is that if I if I won the lottery is this the one that I would buy? And is this the process that I would do? And the answer is no way on earth if I had money. I bet you would. I bet you'd buy, you'd buy five of them or 10 of them. You if I did, I would pay somebody at that point to do the work. I like the remodeling process. I like designing things. But they I would do see... it wrong. And then you'd go up there and you'd rip out what they did. <laughs> no, it's funny that you say that because that's exactly <laughs> what I, I hired. One guy to help me with the trim and I got up there and it was sticking out from the wall like a quarter inch where it shouldn't have stuck out. And I ripped it off and I chiseled it down. I routed it out and then I put it back Lee, on. If, if you won the lottery, you would buy the worst thing in the best area. So like downtown Paris, you'd buy a flat, the worst flat. You'd be out there flying over every weekend with your with your saw. No, but the thing is, if you've got enough money, you can pay the people who do it right anyway. Right. And then you, if they don't do it right, then they're the ones that rips it out and redoes it. If you're paying enough money, you're paying that luxury. So anyway, so I, I contest Will's, Will's saying basically the idea is show me your life and I'll show you who you are, basically. Mm-hmm, you know what right. I mean? But mm-hmm. circumstances dictate what you do and how you do it. And yeah, you can't get around that. But then I wonder too, if, if like you, you meet somebody who, who has won the lottery or they have made it big and, and they're living their life are, you know, and then are they happy? Like, does, um, you know, are they happy with this new 
sort of standard or, or do they just have the same sort of anxieties and the same sort of uh, wants and needs that aren't quite being scratched, right? That they, that they well, got from- I, I, I mean, that's a different conversation, but in my opinion, the lottery is the worst thing that could almost happen to someone because mm-hmm. people haven't been trained to have that kind of lifestyle. Like rich people, if they've grown up wealthy, there's a certain... I don't know, protocol to what work is and to what life is and how mm-hmm. things work. And if you thrust somebody into that, I'll use my analogy of a, of a physical trainer. If you were to magically take somebody who's 500 pounds and make them in perfect shape overnight, mm-hmm. they would be back to 500 pounds within a year or two because mm-hmm. they don't know how to live as a thin athletic person. Mm. That's true. That's interesting. And I, uh, I knew a guy who, uh, was in the NBA and he was seeing he, humble brag. <laughs> he's now a coach. He's now a basketball coach for, I think BYU is where he's at or UVU. I can't remember. Uh, Mark Pope. Anyways, I was talking to his wife and she was like, she was saying, yeah, he, so his dad was a, a financial advisor. So they knew how to manage money. And when he got into the NBA, he's like, okay, you're going to, be getting paid a really good salary. Here's how you use your money. Here's how you don't blow it. Right. And so what he did was he just lived off of his daily stipend. So uh, these guys would go to a city, they'd get money for food, they'd get money for a hotel, they'd get money for all this stuff. Right. And that's what he would live off. And so he had this cheap apartment, he drove a minivan, all of his furniture was like secondhand. And his actual paycheck, he was tucking away and like investing, right? Smart. Um, but then he was noticing all these guys from lower income areas, uh, lower income backgrounds, and they'd be, you know, essentially win the lottery. You're in the NBA, you get you're, you get this great bo- sign, signing bonus. You're getting a great right. income, and they were buying cars for every member of their family, and they were buying two houses and this and that. And he's right. just like, these guys are going to be broke in five years, you know, when they blow out their knee or whatever, right. Or, or if they eventually retire. And so he and his dad established like, uh, a, um, like a school, like a training for people, for rookies, essentially new people called the NBA. Uh, here's what you do with your money. Here's how you invest it. Like a, like a very specific financial advisor for this sort of windfall situation now. They, yeah, when they sign, it's mandatory to go into those programs now. Yep. So it, I thought it was really cool, you know, and 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 that that sort of backs up what you're what you're saying there. Yeah, yeah. You can't you can't just all of a sudden change your life. Everything has to change bit by bit. So, so I don't know. Back to if if I would hire it out. And again, I I'm contesting that I don't love the process. Sometimes you do things that you don't love to get to a certain point. Right. Like I hate pickleball. And that's why I played every day. No, that's and, not oh, the not same like thing. That. That's a, like there's that. no there's no goal at the end other than having fun. Like your primary reason for playing is for enjoyment. No, but my it's, but my it's, my, my it's primary for exercise. It's it's for it's for health. No, but you do and enjoy it, correct? No, I hate it. <laughs> you do not hate pickleball. You love it. <laughs> biggest load of malarkey. See, he I knows he knows I've backed him into a corner. Like I'm <laughs> I'm doing this for a reason. But and okay. this is not the, like the remodel part is not the fun part. It's just but sometimes you go through the hard stuff to have the good stuff. Correct. Which, that's that's my point. Which is like, mean, let me ask you this: Do you love all the little hard stuff you're doing with the pickleball Paul books, like all the business stuff, all of the sourcing materials? And in order to be consistent, I have to say yes. So yes, I love it all. <laughs> yeah, but you hate it. <laughs> You hate it. <laughs> yeah, there's always parts that you don't like and parts that you like. I think, yeah, you just have to be willing. I, I what was it? Um uh, Seinfeld was saying you have to uh he was talking about how he writes every day. Every single day he writes, and his process mm-hmm. now is the same process. Or at the time that he said this, I don't know. I think he just drives a Porsche every day now. But at the time that he was saying this, and this was, you know, post Seinfeld success, like, you okay. know, and the show was a huge success. He had, he had gone from uh, this comedian who nobody, nobody knew to being on the tonight show to doing Seinfeld. 
And he said, my process now is the exact same process I had when I was a 20 year old struggling. And that is I sit down and I take a legal pad and I write jokes and whether they're good or bad, I just sit there and write. And my whole, whole thing is I can do, uh, I could do anything I want during that time, as long as it's writing, <laughs> you know? And, and he said that the key to success is finding the torture that you can handle that nobody else yeah. can handle. I heard him tell Howard Stern hmm. that. Maybe that was, yeah, yeah maybe that yeah, was from he, the Howard Stern thing. And he was saying he can't not write, like yeah. while he's driving down the road. His yeah, now it's part of his to, process. You get to so. that point where you just like, uh, it's sort of like with me and running right now. It used to be like the first mile was excruciating. And now I'm like running and I'm like, Oh shoot! You know, I look at my my watch. I'm like, oh, I just I just did two miles, you know. Right, and, it's just and, part of your. I yeah. feel like sketchbook stuff. You know, bringing it around to illustration because that's what we're supposed to be talking about. Yeah. My sketchbook is like that. Sometimes, if I'm not haven't sketched in a long time, I'm very reluctant to pull it out. Sometimes, even when I want to do a sketch, I don't pull it out, mm -hmm. and then I'll start sketching, and it can only be like one or two days straight of sketching, and then I'm just into it again. Yeah. And I'll go, you know, months and sketch in in the sketchbook. I had that same same deal where I I went through like a couple of years where all of my drawing was for projects and there's no like exploration drawing like pull out the sketchbook and come up with ideas it was just like oh shoot deadline let's work on this this project right now draw 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 and and then projects ended and I was like well what what do I do now oh, I guess I should like get out my sketchbook because now I have time to do it and you could actually see in the sketchbook like 50 pages of bad drawings or drawings that are like uninspired, right? <laughs> Reluctant drawings, yeah. Yeah. And, and also spaces between, because I've been dating my sketchbook. This is my most recent sketchbook. It's taken a year to finish. And now I'm finally on the last half of this year. I started it last September, finishing it, probably finish it in October. I'm starting to like actually sketch in it every day. And the drawings are a little bit looser and more fluid and like the ideas are coming and stuff and it just it just, just takes in, that, in the zone yeah a yeah. little more that's right yeah. that's right all right should we should we launch a podcast let's pod yep. okay let's cast 